Welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's story is from the incredible mind of our brother from another mother, Mr. Michael G. Lockhart. And as ever, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. Well, it really does help out the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story. And title. The Return of Randy Hall. Let's get straight into that. Three staccato raps sounded on Marie's front door. And she was a little startled, and fleeting thoughts scattered across her mind, drawn from somewhere in the deep recesses of memory and the pain of profound loss. That's the way Randy used to knock to let me know he was home from school. She pushed aside the maudlin feelings, and whipped the welling emotions back into the prison in which she had confined them for the past twenty years. She looked through the small portal near the top of the door to determine whether her visitor was someone from whom she would open the door and welcome, or whether it was someone who may pose a threat. In recent times, her home was a place she no longer considered safe. The entire area had degenerated in her lifetime, and in her estimation, people would simply no longer be trusted anymore. And she wondered briefly why her dog was not barking and snuffling at the door. Count Bass the Eighth was wary of strangers and protective of his mum. As she could see the outline of a lanky figure on the porch, about Randy's size, maybe a few inches taller, the spidery thoughts skidded once again. It was early evening, and the light wasn't at all the best angle, and so the figure was mostly a silhouette. The brim of a ball cap further obscured the features, and she started to call out and ask who was her unexpected visitor, when he spoke first. Hey, Mom, it's Randy. My key won't work. Let me in, please. Marie nearly collapsed. Her heart stopped for an eternity, and then pounded furiously, infused with the sharp thrill of her adrenal gland pumping. The voice was right. Mostly, she decided. Maybe a little deep, more like his father's, she vacillated. Randy had disappeared around two decades earlier. There was no way it could be him. It had to be some cruel hoax, or maybe a robber or murderer, a mind raced and filled with paranoid illusions of creepy men intent on making prey of her. Mom, you home? I saw you peep out of me. The statement was followed by a friendly chuckle, one that had lifted the hearts of any who knew Randy, and had instantly made him new friends since he was a mere infant. It couldn't be. But maybe, just maybe, a miracle boy had returned after so long. Hesitantly at first, and then with increasing eager anticipation, tinged with a remnant of fear and the skittering spider thoughts, she opened the locks and bolts, and then turned the handle and stepped back from the threshold. She used the door panel to protect most of her body, just in case. And there stood her precious boy, her miracle baby, infectious, lopsided grin, large sincere eyes, a face that inspired trust and an offer of open friendship. He appeared the same way in every detail that she could recall, as he had on the day he had left the day her world had shifted and her life fell to ruins. And she staggered backwards as if struck by a hammer. Randy rushed forward and saved her from potentially a nasty fall. Mom, are you okay? What's the matter? If he had said more, she didn't hear it for a while. And for the second time in her 72 years on earth, Marie Hall fainted. 20 years earlier. Mom, have you seen my other water bottle? I could swear I put it in the fridge last night to freeze it. Randy asked his mother as she bustled nervously about the kitchen. I don't think so, MB. She smiled a little, and she called him MB from the time he was born. Her miracle baby. Later, miracle boy. Born after years of effort on the part she and her husband. Every doctor they'd seen had assured her that she would never produce a child. Then, about a month before she turned 37, her miracle arrived. 
all of seven and a half pounds and completely healthy. She pointlessly joined him at the open door of the cooler and peered in around his shoulder. When did he get so tall? It was such broad shoulders, she wondered. A more nasally male voice sounded from nearby entrance to the attached garage. I got it, buddy. Uncle Dan entered the kitchen wearing a grin to match Randy's. His brother Randy's father had died a few years previously, and he had declared to Marie that he would do his best to fill in the parental role for the sake of his brother's son. Randy and Marie appreciated him, but didn't have the heart to tell him that it just wasn't the same. He'd never be the man Otto Hall was. And Dan tossed the frozen tube of the bottle to his nephew. I took it out of the freezer so you wouldn't forget. You about ready? The men, Marie supposed, though she wasn't quite ready to think of her boy that way. Perhaps young man, in his case, said their goodbyes and pledged to Marie that they would be back on Memorial Day Monday. She in turn assured them that she had plenty to do and would enjoy the extra rest that went with an empty house. Count Bastaforth nuzzled her hand and wagged his tail to remind her that she would have company and protection. Randy supplied one of his infamous chuckles and Dan typically just shrugged and turned to go to his truck. Marie and Randy's eyes met briefly. She felt a shock of fear. An icy tendril slivered up her spine. She almost called out for him to stop, to stay there at home, safe with her. He winked and the moment faded. They would haunt her for the next two decades. She convinced herself that day that she was being silly and overprotective. Things had been difficult since her husband Otto had died unexpectedly. Now Randy was all she had. Well, that and the dog, Count Basta Fourth. A Bouvier de Flanders, an enormous curly shaggy monstrosity. A breed related improperly to poodles, at least the larger variety. Randy felt a pang as he turned away from his mother. He always felt guilty when he left her home for more than daily life. Yet he knew from her own genuine assurances that they occasionally needed time to themselves. He would have to share his time with Uncle Dan. He rolled his eyes. While the man was nice enough, he rarely initiated conversations. He was somewhat socially awkward. Randy recalled that his father had spoken of Dan as passive-aggressive when he thought Randy was out of earshot. It didn't mean much to him. Dan offered a free ride to a place he wanted to go, a safety body who was mostly reticent and would leave him in peace. He patted Count Bass and scratched him where it did the most good, and then Randy told him to. Go guard, Mum. The big pooch snapped his jaws to attention, spat around a bit of jowl juice in every direction, and then turned about and trotted back indoors, his duties apparently clear. During the early part of the drive, Randy was thinking of how he'd like to have taken along Count Bass, the quasi-poodle with fangs and attitude. When he startled from his reverie by Uncle Dan's jutted sausage of an index finger, aggressively intruding his periphery. Hey, look at that old truck. Probably 58 or 59. Randy, hard racing from the sudden invasion of his space and vision, paused for a moment, and then turned to look out the window. Uncle Dan had slowed, but... Whatever he'd seen was no longer easily in Randy's view. Maybe an old pickup parked outside of home, he speculated. Ah, you want to go back and have a look? His uncle inquired. Randy knew that the question was likely rhetorical. It would be dumb to stop, turn around and go back just to look at an old truck. He took out his device and quickly pulled up several photos of vintage pickup trucks of the specified years, then held up the screen towards Dunn. I got it covered, Uncle Dan. I'd rather get to the trail so we can get the first half done today. After a couple of hours driving, they just below the speed limit in every zone. They turned into the long road that led to the state park. Dan checked them in at the station and obtained a parking pass for their campsite. He'd arranged it all in advance. He'd insisted on doing pretty much everything on their outings, as though Randy was still a small child. Randy suppressed his resentment and focused on their upcoming adventures. He and his father had enjoyed hiking together. They were no pioneer explorers, but they tackled a few intermediate trails the year Otto had died. Dan would never schedule anything but novice trails. It didn't matter that much to Randy. He'd be out in the wilderness, no school, 
no work, no chores, only the rocks and trees and critters. Still, he wanted to tackle the Mockingbird, the toughest of the intermediate overnight trails, as a way to prepare for an advanced trail. It'd take along a couple of his old scout bodies for that venture, later in the summer. It didn't take long to set up their base camp. It was a simple affair of two tents angled, with the front sections facing one side of the fire pit. But there was a small picnic table on the other side, a pathway that led to a group of trailheads on the angle between the tents and the fire pit. The entrance and exit trail to the parking area was opposite. Now they used similar sites for the past two years. Otto had never made reservations. It always insisted that if they couldn't find a designated camping space, or they'd find an undesignated one out in the bush. And then he'd grin his lopsided grin and chuckle in a deeper version of Randy's. The thoughts of his dad cheered Randy. It wasn't fair that he'd died so young, of an old person's disease. Congestive heart failure. Why, it never made sense to Randy. His father had been fit and ate well. He may have had more stress at work than he'd ever let on to Randy, but he appeared to be pretty stable and happy. Then, boom. Shortly after he arrived at his office one day, he collapsed. Randy heard the ER doctor talk him at down. The doctor told him that Otto was dead before he hit the carpet. Hey, Randini, Dan called to his nephew. Once we get this done, you are for a little stroll. We only have two days. He spoke as though he'd been the one urging an immediate start. Randy nodded enthusiastically. It's still early. Maybe we could try the Mockingbird? It's an overnight and we could finish tomorrow. Then rest up and goof off a little here at camp before the drive home on Monday. This time of year, no need for the tents, just a tarp and a sleeping bag. Easy to hump on that trail. Dan looked doubtful and squinted at his electronic map. I don't know, bird. That one's marked as intermediate. Might be too tough for one day. Randy stood and stared, trying to keep the resentment from his features. It should have been Dan who died of a heart issue. He's a fat lump. The nasty notions well within him. Why, Dad? He was so much better. A real man. Eventually, disdain ringing in his mind, though perhaps not in his tones, he responded. So, what trail do you want to tackle? Dan peered at him, clearly sensing that something was amiss. I was thinking, the chipmunk. Wore a humorous smirk. Randy couldn't tell if he was joking. He thought he was joking and failing or trying to goad him. He often suspected a latter in his uncle, especially since Otto had died. Passive, aggressive, like Dad said. I'll play, he determined. Oh, that one's for Cub Scouts. Maybe you're looking at the wrong one. Those EMAPs can be unreliable. His father had told him to eschew electronics and rely on hard copy maps in clear waterproof cases, paired with a compass. Uncle Dan completely trusted the tech and what it told him to do. Another point of unspoken contention between them. Uh, you probably mean the cotton tail? He added with just a hint of sarcastic humour. The cotton tail was the shortest and easiest route, wider with numerous signs and no more than a mile and a half. It was rated for baby strollers. Dan practically scowled. Genuine anger flashed ever so briefly across his features. And then, a wicked grin, he posited a counter-offer. No, I was mistaken, all right? But I was thinking maybe the coyote. Why, it's ready to advance, if you're up to the challenge. You may want to do something easier today and then tackle that one tomorrow. All other thoughts rushed from Randy. The coyote? He and Dad had discussed it for the next hike before. Well, before... So, Mockingbird today and... Coyote tomorrow? You're on. Let's go. Dan worked his mouth like a perch a few times. Randy had outmaneuvered him in a banter battle. He never intended to take the coyote. He'd assumed that the boy would back out of the challenge and he could then assert his control. Now, if he argued further, he knew the boy would resist out of stubbornness, just like his father. Plus, he corralled himself into tackling an advanced trail. He knew he was no longer in shape for such a feat and had hoped to go novice trails and return to camp each evening. Even those would have been rough hikes for him, but he trusted his stubbornness to get him through it. His smile turned thin-lipped and reptilian, 
and he said quietly, well, let's go, buddy. And Randy simply stared at his uncle. After he grew tired of that, he finally explained, Uncle Dan, intermediate trails are overnight excursions. We have to camp tonight at whatever apex we make it on the trail, then return tomorrow. Advanced trails are three-day to two-night hikes. We either do two novice trails or one intermediate. The Mockingbird is the best choice. I haven't done it yet, but the staff claim it's the hardest trail other than the advanced ones. Dan slumped, defeated. The boy was even smarter than his father. Dan was no dummy, but Otto had been special. Had made the family proud with his intellect and will to achieve. However, maybe he could gain some respect from the boy if he completed the hike. But he was sure he'd be able to do it. So, do we take down the tents if we're staying outside on the trail tonight? Randy grinned. Nah, those are for getting some real sleep tomorrow night after we are exhausted. We won't fill up to erecting them then. That's why we prepare today for the contingencies tomorrow. Stay ready so we don't have to get ready. My dad and I always slept under the stars. We brought tarps along just in case. Didn't you bring yours? And by Monday afternoon, the men had not returned and Marie had grown anxious. She had tried doing minor chores and even watching some television. Reading was out of the question, since she'd only stare at a single page and not read in twenty times. But her mind was constantly drawn to where her son was, and to the clock, that now displayed a time long past their scheduled return. They should have been back in signal range, so she tried several times to call. Each time, the calls went directly to voicemail. And she had an uneasy weekend, as though some fearsome doom hung over her, despite the numerous little tasks in which she had engaged to keep her thoughts occupied. Now, she convinced herself that everything was fine, that they were probably having a great time and lost track. Maybe they decided to stop somewhere, Maybe their batteries had run down unnoticed and they neglected to charge them in Dan's truck. Dan liked to take she and Rowdy out to eat and maybe he decided that they should have a male bonded meal. Maybe they'd encountered some minor difficulty. Or maybe the truck had suffered mechanical difficulties. No matter how hard she tried to think of alternatives to horror and mayhem, the dark cloud persisted and it set a gloom and dread in every scenario. Maybe they're Maybe they're wrecked in a ditch. Maybe some rabid animal or venomous reptile has bitten one or both of them. Maybe some maniac. She struggled against the increasingly absurd notions of disaster until at some point the sun sank into the west and took along her heart. The dread asserted itself and nodded her emotions like Count Bass with a soup bone. She sat and stared alternately at the door, the window and the ceiling. The big canine huffed and placed his heavy head on her lap in an attempt to comfort her. And despite himself, he let out an uncharacteristically forlorn whine and rolled his eyes towards the front door in concern, hope. Marie patted her monster poodle and tried to comfort him as a way to calm her own nerves. Inaction, however, did not suit her nature. She tried every half hour to call each of her family members who might possibly have heard anything. She called around to people who knew Dan and Randy's many friends, none had heard from either of them. Exasperated, she called the park station and reported them missing. They assured her that they would conduct a welfare check at the campsite and no, they had not signed out of the registry, but that was common. They did not call back as the person on the receiving end of the call had promised. They did not answer when she called again. She had to leave a voicemail, which had become a tiresome necessity, the day and evening. The call had gone immediately to voicemail system, so someone was on each of the lines, but there was no interminable ring as the other government offices, only the mechanical response that people left when they presented generic, empty, electronic messages. The torture continued until the next day dawned and found her passed out on the sofa in a fitful doze. Count Bass slumped on the floor beside her and neither had slept well. A series of sharp raps at the door startled her awake. Count Bass stood, curled stiff, and a growl rumbling from deep within his chest. He faced the door, but when his mistress began to rise, he whined and retreated to the kitchen, as though he did not want to hear what the visitors would say. Marie's heart leapt with joy. Randy! 
It had to be her miracle boy. She didn't pause to wonder why he'd knock at the front portal to their home, rather than his usual key, and she completely ignored Count Bass's odd behaviour. She didn't notice the heavier, slower timbre of the knocking. She simply flew to the door and opened it widely. Her smile instantly faded, and her countenance fell as she registered that the party on her doorstep consisted of law enforcement and other official-looking personages. Her fear swallowed reason, and she staggered backwards. And for the first time in her life, Marie Hall fainted. When she came to, she discovered that the officer had scrambled forward and prevented her from colliding with the floor, mostly. Somehow, she'd been moved to the sofa in the living room. An EMT shone a small light into her eyes and murmured, Looks like she's conscious, Captain. The features of the burly officer loomed over Marie. Ma'am, my name is Harry Compton. I'm a captain and division commander from the sheriff's office. We're here to discuss the situation with your son and brother-in-law. Marie choked back a sob. The impending sense of doom was gone and the despair it had portended had arrived and crashed like a wave on her consciousness. Yet she had to hear it. She had to know. Is my son, is he alive? She could not bring herself to use the inverse of that word, dead. Though that was the word that flashed into her mind, like an unwelcome lightning strike on a haystack. Like the haystack, her thoughts were in danger of igniting into destructive flames. Well, we think so, ma'am. The captain attempted to balance hope with doubt by projecting cautious optimism. He feared to offer too much of a former, yet did not wish to crush her, the latter. At least, not yet. Until they had to. Well, they gone missing. We just got word to include that a search party is being organised. The park staff did not find them yesterday evening or last night, but the tents and truck that belongs to Daniel Hall were located. Everything seems in order. They're doing everything they can to find your son and brother-in-law, ma'am. Marie was sure that the captain was withholding some information, but she set aside her feelings and rounded up a few necessities, while the delegation of local officials tried to convince her to remain at home and monitor her phone. The police acted only to remind her to take along her walking shoes and umbrella. She ushered up the well-meaning group from her home, and with the assistance of a now stiff-legged, grumbling Count Bass, and paused only long enough to lock the door as she left to go find her son. The big quasi-poodle seemed content to get a ride in her front seat, despite Marie's insistence that he wear the shoulder harness safety. Now Marie did not find her son nor did the massive search parties who crept over the search grid so many times. When she knew that they were nearing the end of their search, she stood, peering tearfully, at the lead ranger, her lower lip trembling, every aspect of her body language screaming desperation. The short, round woman, whose nameplate declared her to be El Campos, pulled a grim face. Mrs. Hall, we're going to extend our search to some areas we haven't covered as thoroughly, because they were unlikely to yield results. People in distress don't typically climb, and these places are hard to reach. But, on the advice of some of our colleagues, we'll look at some peaks and craggy places tomorrow. It's a long shot, but we want to try everything before we... we call off the search. Then Marie managed to sincerely thank the woman, and with the drooping Count Bass, she set off for her room. A little weekender cabin that the park's folks had set aside for her. But there was plenty more searching for them both to do. Neither Count Bass nor the hounds the searchers brought had offered any sign of locating a trail before the thunderstorm arrived. Aircraft who conducted countless fruitless passes over the entire park. They even had boats search the river and lake nearest to the campsite. She dismissed that idea. Ronnie was a strong swimmer, but he'd gone on this trip to hike. Or maybe he went for a swim after they returned, to call off and rinse away the dust and sweat of the trail. A dismal thoughts intruded, and Count Bass nuzzled her, his eyes pleading an apology for being unable to locate the scent of his boy, his packmate. They cleaned up, ate a little late supper, and were soon flopped on the bed in exhausted slumber. On the next morning, as Marie and her search buddies were about to depart, the short, round lead ranger, Linda Campos, approached her. We're in a stern visage and clearly holding back dreadful news. 
The woman was intelligent enough to know that Marie's first and only real concern was Randy, and so she decided to blurt at least the first part of the message. Uh, Mrs. Hall, we located your brother-in-law. He's alive, but in bad shape. She saw that message induced immediate nausea in Marie, and quickly added, There's still no sign of your son. There was no indication that they were together when, whatever happened to Mr. Hall, Daniel happened. Marie's heart filled with determination. Where? She managed to grit while swallowing her rising gorge. Lead Ranger Campo shook her head. Now he's, he's already transported to the hospital. So far he's been unresponsive. They're working on him. He's mostly dehydrated. It was above freezing the past several nights, and he found one of the creeks that eventually leads to the river and the recreational lake. He sat near it, waiting for someone to rescue him. He's in shock. Maybe physical, maybe emotional. Probably both. We'll have to wait and see. You may want to go with the other searchers to look for Randy. We're shifting the focus to see not only where their paths may have separated, but to include the area around the creek. It's close to where it joins the river. If Daniel had followed it, he would have found his way back to the public areas. She paused before she turned away to set her teams to task. This means we'll be able to add some time to our search for Randy. It's been five days. Despite the thunderstorm on day two, shortly after you and your pup arrived, we estimate that he's strong and knows his way around the wilds. It'll be harder to track him after that weather, but there's still a good chance. Marie wasn't listening. She began searching for the vehicles that would transport them to the new search area. Linda did not blame her one bit. The Mockingbird Trail Randy gazed out in amazement from the peak of the trail. It was the highest point, and with the sharpest descent. He needed some minor climbing gear to achieve the summit, and there was a longer trail that ran around the base for those who had no such gear or the strength and stamina to use it. He issued his famous chuckle and looked back towards where he'd last spied Uncle Dan, laboring and huffing behind him. It had taken him only about ten minutes to make the final climb. He'd taken one last look along the back trail before he stepped up into the climb and saw the slightly obese man waddling and huffing, likely muttering imprecations under his heathen breaths. Now he saw no trace of his uncle. He should have been closer, rather than further from me. He considered in confusion. Could he have turned back when he saw the peak? Or maybe he dropped something. Randy sat to rest from his endeavour and to await the reappearance of his flabby relative. He didn't truly despise him. His intentions were good, or so the man claimed. He was simply not the man Randy's father had been. Randy often found it difficult to imagine them as children. Two people so closely related, but so vastly different in temperament. He finished off his second of four water bottles while he waited. He'd use his canteen overnight and the other two bottles tomorrow. He began to grow frustrated. He did not want to have to climb back down the base of the rise. He could pick up the lower, long trail, but he had hopes of descending the other side to await old Daniel Boondocks. He decided to call out, just in case there was a problem. Uncle Dan! The name echoed slightly among the rises and dips of the landscape and among the trees that had grown sparse as the rocks had grown more numerous. Uncle Dan, you okay? Not even the birds answered. Nothing stirred. Only a slight breeze. What a hint of moisture on it. Maybe a hint of ozone like what presaged a thunderstorm. Hey, Danny boy! He cried as loudly as he was able. It's what his father had called his older sibling. And there was still no response. He uttered a few choice words and prepared to make his descent. It was easier than the climb, but more annoying. I bet he's waiting around the next bend for me to calm down so he can have company when he takes the easy path. He probably even denied that I was up top. He grumbled as he reached the base of the 65 to 70 degree slope. He peered down the trail to no avail. He checked the time. It was almost 4.30 in the afternoon. They'd still be back before dark if the Elder Hall would hurry. They were past the middle point and after that they got around the peak 
They'd be on the way back down to the campsite area. There were still plenty of humps to climb, but this was the highest, most difficult part of the trail. Randy finally hefted his pack, checked to ensure that he had everything, and started off down the back trail. When he'd reached the point at which he had last observed his uncle, he looked around for tracks to determine whether the man had turned back down the trail. The tracks were sparse, but there was enough sand that Randy would have been able to spot footprints if they were present. They were not. He triple checked to make sure. He looked around at the rocks and brush and scanned trees. Maybe he had to take a dump, Randy murmured nervously. He heard a distant rumble on the other side of the peak. Oh, definitely a storm on the way. Now I'm mumbling to myself. Oh, it's just so... so quiet. It's making me nervous. He searched the area immediately adjacent to the trail and the ever-widening circle, then trotted back along the trail. He called out and whistled occasionally as the sky darkened above and cast shadows on the ground before him. He turned back up the trail and decided that if the storm hit, he would be better off waiting in camp and calling for help. If he hurried, he might be able to scramble up to the top and take the shorter, steeper route down the last leg of the trail. It would take hours. He hefted himself up onto the peak for the second time that day, even as the first cold, fat drops of rain soaked him. He knew he would not be able to continue the search without help. Maybe he'll be at the campsite. He lied to himself. He stepped forward to continue and complete his journey when his vision became blurred. He heard a woman wailing and the deep barking of a large dog. Mom? Camp Bass? He heard himself call feebly as though his voice had become one of the echoes in the terrain. Dan Hall huffed and puffed his way up the trail, muttering imprecations about the entire concept of recreational hiking. He saw his nephew begin to climb to the peak. It wasn't tall, but the boy should have waited for him. Not to climb alongside him, but just for, for safety. He looked down and focused on the incline he'd managed so far. Randy had finally offered him some hope by telling him that after the peak, the trail would mostly be downhill until they reached their target overnight campsite, near the creek. He tried to barrel ahead to catch up to Randy and to let him know how dangerous it was to make the climb. All he had accomplished was to move a short distance, only to find himself dry heaving to one side of the trail. He grew dizzy and his limbs felt weak and drained of blood for a moment. When he finally shook it off a short moment later, he looked up to see an empty peak, framed by a blue sky and a few white puffy cumuli drifting far above. Randy was nowhere in sight. Miss Ha The young, enthusiastic voice of Ludwig Marie as she and the others on her search team walked the grid. She looked towards the sound and called out, Over here! The young man rushed up to her, wearing a grin, and her heart leaped in relief and hope. He skidded to a stop when Count Bass issued a warning growl and stepped forward, hair bristling on his curly coat. The young fellow, an intern, delivered what she perceived to be good tidings. They found a backpack and think it's Randy's. His was red, wasn't it? Marie found that she was unable to speak, so she simply nodded. Why, well, they say it's in good shape, not torn up or anything. They found some other stuff. They didn't say much over the radio. The young man lifted the radio as if to display evidence of the information he relayed. Come on, uh, we'll take the SUV and go to where they took it. Well, that's got to be a good sign. Now we know that nothing ate... Uh, and that no animals harmed him, or people. Marie didn't bother to call Count Bass. The beast fell in beside her and trotted his heavy gait with a quick lick to his mistress's hand to inform her that he was by her side, prepared for duty, and that in some way he understood that the prospects had improved. Marie absently rewarded the big dog with a scratch behind his closest ear. When they arrived, lead ranger Campos met them, and escorted Marie inside the station. She pointed to a pack that sat on her desk. Marie knew immediately that it was Randy's. She attempted to speak, but could only nod and cry silently as Linda made her report. One of the teens found this on the trail down from what we found, Daniel. Weird as it was the same trail, 
It followed Search. It wasn't there, or it didn't notice it, on the way out to Dan, or on the way back with him, as she reached down under the visitor's chair and hefted a pair of hiking boots. The backpack had a wallet ID. We found these nearby. Can you identify them? Marie nodded and at last found her voice. Where's my... my son? He wouldn't just leave his things out on the trail like that. He took spare socks, but only the one pair of boots. He wouldn't try to walk around in the woods and brush with bare feet. Linda nodded and added quietly. I agree, but now we have a good search area. These things don't look like they were out in the storm. He must have found shelter somewhere. The tone suggested that she genuinely wanted her statement to be true. Uh, the boots. Uh, our boat teams found them on a rock out in the middle of the river, just after the creek flows into it. They were completely dry like the pack. Uh, we're combing the waters, uh, just in case. Marie shook her head vehemently. No, no, no. Randy's a strong swimmer. He used to swim in that river and the lake up in the public recreational area. He couldn't have. Her face fell once more in grief. Linda patted her shoulder. It's just routine. We have to look everywhere we can. If he entered the water, he could have made the crossing. Maybe he stopped to rest and forgot his boots. If an animal was chasing him. We've had several signs of pumas and several visitors have reported a small pack of wolves. Maybe he got scared by them. In any case, this gives us more search time and a better chance of finding Randy alive. Marie was not comforted. Once again, she and Count Bass shifted search areas. On the tenth day, with no more signs of Randy, lead ranger Campos and the park manager broke the news that the search would be scaled back and the official parties would be sent home. Volunteers would be available for a while longer, but hope had dwindled that they would locate a living Randy Hall. Linda tried to blunt the news, but she could see that Marie had begun to reach the same conclusion. Her miracle boy was gone. And Dan soon recovered his senses and told a piteous tale, full of self-remonstration with hints of heroic efforts on his part. I looked for a long time and called until my voice was gone. I didn't know what else to do, so I followed the trail around the peak and towards the apex campsite. It was late afternoon, almost evening. As I reached the halfway point around the peak, my map device failed. It didn't just lose the signal. It stopped working, like the battery was drained. He peered around his hospital room as though the device might reappear on some available surface so he could prove his veracity. The space was crowded by officials and investigators. And one of the latter stepped forward. I had a rescue team located your device in your tent at base camp. How would you account for that? Dan looked confused for a moment. You mean the phones? The investigator simply cocked his head as though attempting to hear better. We left those in the real tents, like you said. I have a location device with a map program and GPS. A rugged one that was not supposed to foul or lose signal in the wilderness. He rolled his eyes to indicate his feelings on the quality and efficiency of the ruggedness of the product. Did you find that? His tone grew a little sarcastic. He still didn't feel himself, and the man looming over him seemed to imply that Dan was involved in some sort of cover-up or had committed some sort of crime. The man continued to stare, and then glanced around at a full interior space and stepped back to observe and listen until he had the chance to get the man he considered the primary suspect alone. Others questioned Dan. His confusion and poor recollection slowed the process, but they eventually elicited more of his version of events. As it was starting to get dark, I walked off the trail to take a... Uh, to relieve myself. Somehow I, I got turned around and couldn't find the path. He hung his head, eyes downcast. I guess I... I guess I panicked a little. I'm no kind of Davy Crockett or anything. I only went hiking to be a guide for Randy, a responsible adult, since my brother's past. He rolled up his eyes a little to ensure that everyone was still riveted by his tale. I kept walking in circles, trying to find the trail, but when it got dark, it got really dark. I couldn't even see the moon. I stumbled through the brush and then trees. It was getting cool, not freezing or even cold, just, you know, cool, 
for the t-shirt and shorts that I was wearing. I left my heavy stuff in the tent back at base, blessed to carry and had my sleeping bag. Didn't really expect to be up and walking all night. He shrugged. I finally found a big rock and I sat down. I was exhausted and figured I could find the right path come daylight. I guess I slept some, but I didn't find the path that next day. I found a little stream and filled up my bottles. I was really tired and my feet and back, they hurt. Glanced around to see if there were any expressions of sympathy. There were none. Only countenances that spoke of the need for him to finish his tale of woe. Dunn sighed. <sighs> After stumbling around all day, I was really hungry and thirsty. I drank all the water in my bottles. Found a few trees that were all grown out together in a clump so I made a nest. I guess with pine straw and some rotten branches. Wasn't much protection, and I wish I'd brought along that top like Randy had said. I used the sleeping bag to keep the pine needles from poking me. And he paused for a moment, and then I'll take note of the increased attentiveness of the investigator. Ah, that boy has an even harder head than his father. He shook his head and tears welled at the corners of his eyes. He suddenly looked up into the faces that surrounded his bed. Please, find him. We don't always get along, but... He's a good kid. Looks out for his mother. Always smiling. He cast his eyes downwards once again and fought to control a wet snuffle. At last, he composed himself and continued his epic. I tried going back uphill, thinking I should stay where that peak had been. I couldn't see it with the trees. Well, that's a very big hill. Not really a mountain or anything. At least not like what you see in travel brochures or movies. Well, I found some berries and Ate my last energy bar the day before. Spent the rest of that day vomiting all night. Well, you know, the other end. Things got hazy after that. Found that creek and I started to follow it. Randy had said the creeks would lead to the river and that led to the lake and recreation areas. I walked as far as I could and then sat. I was hungrier than I'd ever been. I was scratched off from the trees and brush and chewed on by mosquitoes and other bugs that had been in the pine straw bed. And he trout off weakly. And that's... That's where you found me. I guess. I remember listening to the water in the creek. It sounded like a singing woman. Real sweet. Like a lullaby. And during the latter part of his story, he slumped back onto his mattress, as though the weariness had returned in full. In the subsequent days, he discovered that he was indeed the focus of an investigation. Routine process, the investigator assured him. We have to clear every angle. Dan did not like the implications that he had anything to do with his nephew's disappearance. He insisted that he wanted to go assist with the search efforts. He was out at a hospital, and no one had told him that he was prohibited from doing so. And so he drove out to the ranger station to volunteer. He didn't try to find Marie. He could not yet face her. He knew that they would likely find the boy's remains, if anything. Ah, I don't want that, he told himself. Even if it clears me, I don't. He shook his head vehemently. He had trouble locating his search group, but eventually made it to the area of operation. He never noted the two figures who shadowed him. No, Dan couldn't have harmed Randy. He loved my son. Uh, they didn't always like each other, but he wouldn't hurt him. I don't think he could. She paused and added with a wan smile. Not only emotionally, but, well, Randy would have cleaned his clock, as my husband used to say. I suppose if there was a reason, Dan could have sneaked up behind him. And she shook her head. But no, there couldn't be. Dan is the one who suggested the trip. He wanted to fill the father role for M.B., she had to stop and explain the pet name and the story behind that to the investigators. She knew that they'd checked her story and she saw through the many questions they'd asked out of what they attempted to project as genuine personal interest. She didn't care. She liked that they appeared to be competent and thorough. It only mattered that they find her son. Well, ma'am, our primary suspect from the beginning was Daniel. If not him, then we are out of potential criminals who may have harmed your son. Daniel denied any specific knowledge of where Randy might be, and 
his story checks out so far, as we can tell. He's being consistent in his statements, and while he wasn't any help in search, he definitely give his full effort. Definitely no Tarzan, but he's worn out his boots walking those search grids. The big detective, who had been so sure that Daniel was guilty of something, shrugged in frustration. The good news is that we have no real evidence of foul play, and so we're back to a missing person. I know that's no comfort, especially with even the unofficial search terminated. Still, he could turn up. Everybody we've spoken with says he's resourceful and knows the outdoor skills he needs. Marie thanked the detectives and then completed packing to return home. She had some bills to settle and wanted to clean out the refrigerator and get everything in order for the long wait until she could once again return and resume the search. She planned to post the details of Randy's disappearance everywhere she could on social media and even hard copy flyers and she would alert every set of eyes and ears she could to search for her missing boy. She sobbed a little. Envy had taken on a new and tragic meaning for her and so her fruitless search began. It was greatly assisted when she was able to retire at age 65. That same year, she fell on the steep slope. And by the time she had healed, she knew that she would no longer be able to attempt the wild trails that had consumed all of her spare time and resources. And so, she helped coordinate searches for other people who went missing. Most of them were located quickly, but too many were never seen again. Or worse, were found deceased. Over the ensuing years, she went through a few more Count Bass incarnations. Each was a direct descendant of their first Count Bass they'd gotten as a pup when Randy was still a pup himself. She finally reached Count Bass the Eighth, and she decided that he would be the last. He was young and rambunctious, and larger than any of his predecessors. It was almost too much to handle, especially in those first two years when he liked to jump up at her. She could barely sustain his weight on a leash, and it dragged her everywhere often painfully. They become a pair, as had the others, and by the twentieth anniversary of that fateful hiking trip, as she thought of a boon companion and swam back towards consciousness, she wondered where he might be. Why isn't he barking or making a fuss? she whispered. Present Mom? Mom, you okay? Randy's soothing tones quietly penetrated the last of the cobwebs in Marie's mind. She blinked open her eyes and there he was, her miracle boy, in the flesh, no longer missing. She almost passed out again, but he rubbed her wrist and drew her back to alertness. Mom, have you been sick? You look... worn. Your hair, it's... it's grey. Don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm glad to see you, but I hardly recognise you. Marie blinked into his wide, sincere eyes, and then smiled in contentment few would ever understand. The mother of a child thought long gone, returned, and in perfect form, almost. He noted her age as though he was unaware that he'd been gone for so long. Now she noted his. He was no longer an adolescent, but he was far too young-looking to be thirty-six years old, as he should be. They regarded one another in silence for a long moment, and she was finally able to speak. I... I can't believe it. Twenty years and here you are. All that searching mostly to find and bury your poor bones with your family, and now, here you are. I look old to you, and you look too young for the years to me. M.B., where have you been, my son? Randy looked lost for a moment, in mind and spirit, rather than body. Though Marie tightened her grip on his arms just in case to ensure he wouldn't vanish once again. Mom, I, I went hiking. With Uncle Dan, I. Uh, there was a storm, and after that, things got. Oh, things got blurry. I haven't stopped to check any mirrors, but I've been outdoors for a while. Maybe I'm just grubby. He rose and gently pried away his mother's grip, and they walked over to the mirror on the back wall of the living room. He gasped at his appearance. He still looked very young, maybe twenty or so, but his shoulders and chest had filled out and he was a little taller. He had a five o'clock shadow and his hair appeared a little unkempt. Otherwise, it was the same, familiar features that peered back at him from the looking glass. He turned back to face his beloved mother. I guess I, 
I do look different. He shook his head in wonderment. No idea how that happened. Maybe you should tell me what you mean about me being missing. What's happened to, uh, with you? Over the next hour, Marie explained the events that had led to her react so strongly to her son's appearance at the front door. He interrupted only a few times for clarification, but otherwise sat in rapt attention, his special grin ebbing and flowing at the emotional high and low points of the narrative. In the end, Marie finished with, Now tell me, son, where have you been? It doesn't matter that much. It doesn't matter that much. I'm just over the moon that you're here with me. Still, I, I just can't understand. Randy sat back, his face turned downward in concentration. Mama, I just don't know. I don't recall anything after I climbed that peak for the second time. After Uncle Dan disappeared. Then, a thunderstorm. He quickly related his own tale to his mother. He told her about the hike, the climb, losing and searching for Dan, then climbing up the incline a second time. That's it, Mom. Next thing I knew, I was at the front door, fishing in my pockets for my house keys. He stared into the middle distance. I don't remember how I got here from off that peak in the trail. A harsh bark and growl interrupted his account as he stood as Count Basta Ape stalked into the room, hackles risen, legs stiff with threat. The rumble in his throat was on the The rumble in his throat was on the type that indicated he was about to attack. Count Bass? Randy uttered in surprise. Where were you, buddy? What's the matter? Marie stood as abruptly as she was able and spoke sharply to the beast. Count Bass, Rouse, Sitson. The dog looked resentfully at her, doing his best to signal why he felt such hostility towards this intruder, and then gave up, snarled and backed away a few steps. Recalcitrant, bordering on mutinous. He neither calmed nor sat. He simply glared at Randy, his jaws gaped and foam at the corners of his mouth. Marie uttered a corrective command. Nine! Rouse! More forcefully. The dog, trembling with repressed rage, backed once again, clearly torn between his instinct to tear and rend on behalf of his packmate and his obedience to his alpha. No better choice, he retreated into the kitchen and remained on guard. Normally, Marie would follow and correct his refusal to obey commands, but she was distracted. She turned to Randy. I'll put him out back. He's not the same Count Bass you knew, MB. This is Count Bass the Eighth. Randy grinned at being called MB. <laughs> okay, Mom. Not sure why he's so mad at me. Maybe he's scared. Marie ushered her protector out through the back door of the home, and Count Bass kept his focus on Randy the entire time. He hovered near the portal, pacing nervously, but Marie ignored him and bustled back inside to keep Randy in sight. She felt the need to do so, even more than did Count Bass. As she offered him some supper, and realised they had both been talking for a long while, without anything to drink. Randy sat politely at the table. He looked a little puzzled when she spooned out a reheated helping of what she called goulash, a mix of macaroni, ground meat, and veggies, enhanced with her own tomato sauce and spices. She knew it had always been one of his favourites, now he stared at a plate with a hearty helping, regarding the light steam that rose gently from it. You know, Mum, I don't really feel too hungry. He looked at the tall glass of iced tea beside the plate. He sniffed at the contents, and then tried a quick sip as though he had never before tasted the preferred drink of the household for his entire life. He looked up at Marie. Would you mind if I just had a tall glass of plain water? Marie took a turn in a land of confusion. The boy's behaviour was peculiar and inexplicable. He should have been famished. But she brushed aside any doubts or concerns and mentally shrugged. And then with a joyful heart she thought, My miracle boy, he's back. So, Uncle Dan, he claims, look for me, huh? Randy picked up the threads of the conversation. Marie nodded as she chewed at her supper. Randy might not be hungry, but she was. After swallowing the morsel and down on a bit of iced tea, she added, Once he recovered, he went on and on about how he'd done his best to find you. 
his story more from him as hopelessly lost to him, heroically challenging the elements to find his beloved nephew. Naturally, the law enforcement folks hauled him in for question on several occasions. We all suspected that he'd done something to you or at least had abandoned you after some misfortune. Dan maintained until the day he died that he would never harm you, though. She shook her head in wonder. Uh, he had a way of convincing himself that he was better than he was. Randy barked a little laugh. Ha! I'm glad he's dead. I didn't like that one. Uh, him. Too much. Always saying one thing but keeping back his true feelings behind his little pig eyes. Marie was a little shot. She never cared much for Dan, but he and Randy had seemed to get along well enough. She stared at her son. Her concerns over his behavior were growing. I didn't realize that your relationship was so toxic. She oddly inflected the end of the sentence to imply a question and invite further explanation. Randy chuckled. It was almost but not quite the endearing expression of humor that Marie recalled. It had taken on a slight, hmm, edge. <laughs> he was a fat lump with feelings of inadequacy and hostility. No lass. How long did he live after... Uh, after I didn't return? The Marie studied the remains of her goulash, her appetite fading. Almost three years. He sometimes came along on my hikes when I go looking for you. She smiled wanly. He never was much help, though. Always huffing and puffing and complaining. I got fed up the last time he tagged along and told him that... If he didn't want to be there, he could go elsewhere. And she blushed. Well, I told him where to go, but I felt bad a few months later when he died from a stroke. Randy chuckled again, this time with a definite sinister undertone. <laughs> Good for you, Mum. He never looked for me. He just disappeared. I looked for him. He trailed off and his gaze became distant. I remember doing that bit before the storm. He shook off his momentary reverie. Anyway, he's gone. We're here and our lives can continue. What should we do first? And Marie, glad of the change of subject, raised an eyebrow. Oh, I suppose we should clear your missing person status and change the declaration of death that the judge issued. You'll need that to get a job or go to school. Uh, to have a normal life. You can live here. Uh, you must. It's, it's just... What has so much to do, just to re-establish yourself as a living person? And she paused. Why, it won't be easy. You should be a grown man and you can still pass for late teens. Or maybe early twenties. She left another implied question with her tones. Randy placed his unwrinkled, unblemished hand over her own, which was worn and blotched with spots and protruding veins. Why, it won't be a problem. Not sure I need all that stuff, though. I like a driver's license. <laughs> and a car. I don't suppose I can mow lawns for a living anymore. The chuckle resounded, with actual humour restored, and not quite as infectious as Marie recalled. Well, maybe we should take a few days to adjust. There's no hurry about informing any authorities. I doubt they'd continue their search, and my case would have no relevance, since they presume me dead. We'll take care of it once we've adjusted. <sighs> I'm just glad to be home. Well, they talked some more while Marie cleaned the dishes. Randy didn't offer to help. She never had to ask him in the past. He'd always volunteered when they ate together at home. She noted that Count Bass had not returned indoors. Unusual. Usually gets clingy and begs for a taste of my supper. She wondered about the state of her dog as well as her boy. Her MB. She also worried that she was in the midst of some sort of psychotic break and that the entire set of events have occurred only in her head or at best in her dreams. Randy, I didn't say much. He mostly listened while she related the years of her relentless search. And with every syllable, she pled with him to understand that no matter how happy she was at his return, she was still baffled and needed his reassurance that it was all real. And she wanted answers. She felt that she had earned them. He seemed to either fail to comprehend her non-verbal cues or to simply not care. Randy, I'm tired and I've had a terrible shock. A happy one, she quickly added. Just, oh, it takes a toll at my age. She looked around the living room space. 
I got rid of the TV after. After they caught off the search. Didn't care about news anymore and well. She chuckled lightly in her own tongue. <laughs> There's just never anything worth watching anymore. She indicated a small desk and tower set up in one corner of the room. You know how to use a computer? They haven't changed that much. But what you find online may surprise you. She hesitated and then added, You may even want to look up your own case, if you feel you should. See what it's like on our end. Randy smiled at her and his eyes glittered in the lamplight. I think I'll enjoy that, Mother. Then Marie awakened early in the next morning. She fell around with her feet for Count Bass. He typically slept at the foot of her bed and kept her toes and feet warm. His presence always gave her a strong sense of safety and security, since she'd lost Randy. Wait! Her mind called as sleep faded. He's come back to me. My miracle boy is home. She said it aloud to impress on her personal universe and all the cosmos beyond. That it must be so, though she had doubts. She performed her morning ablations and got dressed all the while, attempting to keep her raging emotions under control. She was terrified that she would find the house empty, as it had been for so many years. She stood at her doorway, the panels closed for privacy for the first time in over a decade. She needed none. With the empty rooms and hallway, there had been no need for fear of anyone walking in on her in an awkward state of undress. Eventually, she forced herself to peek timidly into the hallway. She saw nothing and no one. She strained her ears but heard nothing out of the ordinary. The creaks and pops of the setting house and ticking of the antique clock near the foot of the stairs muffled birdsong from outside the windows. A passing automobile. She considered calling out to Count Bass but decided against it. She'd find him in good time. First, she wished to find her miracle boy. And so she took her first hesitant steps and turned towards Randy's old room. If he was real and not some imaginary phantom, as Scrooge assumed in A Christmas Carol, a figment brought on by her reheated goulash, then he would have found his way to his room to sleep. She plodded slowly down the hallway and stopped at his closed door. She strained once more to listen for him, to detect his light snore that should have sounded so sweet and familiar. Yet no sounds issued from within. And after a long moment, she screwed up her courage and lightly knocked. Randy? Are you there, MB? The silence persisted. She knocked and called twice more. On the second attempt, her fears overtook her, and her frame shook, horrified that she might be losing her mind. After the third attempt, reason asserted itself, and she used the emotional momentum to quietly turn the handle and open the door. She found the room empty. It was arranged the same way it had been on the day Randy had left for his tragic hike. She dusted it occasionally, but she left it alone otherwise, always with the ember of hope that burned within her that her boy might return. If he had, he had not used his bedroom. She choked back her emotions and walked to the stairway and crept downwards, each step progressively more cautious. Acidic bile rose in her gullet at the idea that the downstairs would be as devoid of life as the upper floor had been. Her fears were confirmed a few moments later, when she arrived at the foot of the stairs and peered around the open spaces. She made a survey of those areas not immediately within her view and could find no evidence of her son. She found no evidence that any of the events of the previous evening had occurred. Then she noted a blinking light on her decrepit computer. It was all of five years old, ancient for recent devices, or so the sound staff of the textile had informed her, and she approached and used the mouse to awaken the machine. The screen glowed and images from a website dedicated to missing people appeared. Randy's research, she thought hopefully. Maybe he was here after all and followed my suggestion. Or maybe I pulled up this site in my mania. Hi, Mom. A light baritone sounded from behind her and sent her heart into her throat in startlement. Marie whipped around as best as she was able to and coughed out, Randy! Then she continued to cough a few more times. Her son stood there, gazing at her curiously, apparently not entirely sure why his presence had caused her such distress. Marie shook off a startled response. You scared me. 
You've always been a quiet one, though. A little sneaky. She smiled hopefully, eager to determine whether the young man before her would pick up on the banter they'd once enjoyed. He favoured her with his lopsided grin. I was out attempting to count Bass. I'm afraid he will never take a like it to me. Marie nodded. Oh, he's not like his immediate ancestors. Strange he never came in last night. I should probably go feed him and refresh his water bowl. Randy's grin remained placid on his features. No need to bother. I took care of him for you. He's back outdoors and happily away from me. Marie decided to let the matter rest. She was thrilled once again to have her only child back under her roof. He'll warm up to you in time. She waited just a heartbeat or two, and then asked, Are you talking a different way than before? Like you've been studying or something? You're always smart, but you focus more on natural science than anything else. Just an observation. Maybe a hint of where you've been. Randy stared for a moment, and then shrugged. Uh, maybe. You want breakfast? Marie finally asked. The young man shook his head. No, uh, thanks. I already ate. Think I'll continue my research. Weird reading about myself. Never thought about my bio being published like this. It's so detailed. Flattering, I suppose. Did you do that? Marie smiled shyly. Of course. I wanted to share with the world and all the potential searches just how special you were. Uh, ah, I'm sorry. My expressions of time may slip occasionally. I'm still a little bewildered. I thought that if people felt like they truly knew you, then maybe they'd remember something useful or offer to search. In the end, I just wanted them to know what a loss it was that you would no longer be a part of our community or our future. Randy appeared to absorb the information stoically. Then, as he turned to approach the computer station, he threw his famous grin over his shoulder. Thanks, Mom. Marie's heart, so confounded with rising and falling waves of emotion, soared. Randy stayed set at the computer until early afternoon. Marie called out to him. Randy? I lived in the backyard and all over the house and other close by yards. I can't find Count Bass. I'm worried about him, so I'm going to go look around the neighborhood and ask after him. Oh, he's popular with everybody. Who couldn't love a poodle with fangs and attitude? Randy looked up, clearly annoyed, but his tones remained dulcet. Uh, if you wait just a moment, I'll join you. About time I did my part in searching for the missing. He transformed most of his expression into a fussy smile of a smile. Marie didn't like it. It was part of the new Randy, but she nodded her acquiescence. And they soon began to make their rounds in search of her lost dog. How shall we introduce you? she asked, concerned over what his response might be. The young man smiled down at her. He wasn't terribly tall, just taller than her, yet he managed to radiate strength and perhaps a hint of menace. How about referring to me as Randy, if anything at all? Oh, it's really nobody else's business whom you select as a search partner. You were never picky about that. Marie gave a terse nod. Okay. She wondered how he knew about her search partners. In the early days, she did everything possible to recruit. She even flirted with some of the men to keep them interested. Never anything too serious. She saved her focus for her boy. Still, I'm a grown woman. What right has he to judge? She grew a little angry and then realized that he hadn't said anything about men. It probably only meant another slight towards his uncle. She still did not understand why he appeared so hostile towards the dead man. They met with several neighbours. No one seemed at all interested in who the bland young man was, who escorted their neighbour lady. Marie was a fixture and well regarded, and they trusted her judgement. Unfortunately, no one had seen or heard from Count Bass. The pair made a circuit and finished in a little park at the centre of the settlement. It contained a small patch of woods that had become somewhat overgrown. Marie rarely visited the area in recent times. It had taken on a rank ordure of human waste and unwashed bodies. The smells of feral humans who had dropped out of civilized society to abuse substances or indulge the whimsies of minds damaged beyond repair. Whether by said civilization 
of internal factors. She worried intentionally, or no, some of them presented dangers. She didn't know why the nearby homeowners allowed it. Now her thoughts were interrupted by the presence at her side. I don't think we're going to find him. It's getting hard. It'd be time to go drink some water and some tea. You can always call the animal shelter, just in case. Marie nodded. Yes, I suppose we've looked around his usual haunts, places he liked to mark as his own, whenever he could escape the yard. She giggled a little. <laughs> He's an escape artist and a wanderer, not like Count Bass IV. He's still young, though, not as level-headed as your pup. Randy nodded and giggled in imitation of her laughter. <laughs> Very different creatures altogether, I'd say. I didn't care for the new dog. Not very bright, menacing me like he did. Uh, he won't be doing it again. Marie looked up at the young man. What do you mean? I know this dog well. He didn't just run away because he didn't like you. Oh, he's not friendly, but he had warmed to you in time. He suggested that I call the shelter. Did you do something to him? You take him there, scare him away from our home? She could not hold back the accusatory tones. I was more surprised than Randy that she had challenged him. Randy cackled with a maniacal quality and then outright guffawed. He slapped at one knee in his revelry. Eventually, he calmed. His face lost all expression and he turned to face his mother as they both came to a halt. I ate the stupid dog. That's why I haven't been hungry. He wanted to jump on me, but I bit first. I won't have some ludicrous canine try to frighten me from my home. Besides, you don't need him for protection anymore. You have me. Marie stared, open-mouthed. Surely you are joking. You couldn't have. He's... you're... Randy chuckled, a revolting version of the one for which he was known. Sure, mother. Whatever you have to tell yourself. Now... I have discovered some interesting tales about missing people in wilderness parks all over the place. Fascinating subject, especially for me. There's one of them missing. He jerked a thumb, bounced towards the little overgrown park. That little patch might do to produce more missing. He turned and continued walking towards home. I'm coming, Mom. Marie lay awake. She tossed and turned, frightened of the thing, the monster that wore her son's skin and countenance. She muttered a mantra into her pillow. It can't be him, not my MB. It can't be. She did her best to convince herself that the creature that had yet to sleep or eat since his arrival was either an imposter or some warped version of her son. And she shuddered. A changeling. Sent for some nefarious purposes by dark powers. She caught her wandering thoughts and sat up in bed, propping herself with the same pillows. Stupid mind, getting paranoid, like those people who live in the park. She considered. Perhaps she had imagined Randy in this current form. The neighbors had not made a remark about his presence. Maybe he was simply a hallucination, and this was all a dream. She felt the sharp sting of adrenaline, in her heart, an acid churn in her stomach as a heavier than necessary knock sounded at her door. Hey, Mom, you awake? Wondering what's going on with me? With your mind? The door opened a crack, and the young man that wore Randy's features leered in at her. All pretense of his friendly grin evaporated. I assure you, you have not lost your mind, or your miracle boy. I'm just down that hallway. I'm going to spend some time in my old room. Get to know myself better. You sleep tight now. Remember, I'm looking out for you. The door closed firmly, and Marie made a decision. All the years of hiking and scouring the back country had inspired her to learn some survival skills. She walked over to her closet and dug out her old pack. It was light. She traded her tent for it during the last year and she was unable to stay out on the trail overnight. The first item inside was a pistol. It was an in-shoulder rig designed for a woman's figure. The pistol was a light caliber, 
She'd always feared two-legged predators more than wild ones. That's hunt snakes. She shivered. She didn't like the slithery creatures. They were sneaky and unnatural to her mind. Besides, with a lighter caliber, she could actually hit her target. It didn't do much good to have bigger rounds if they flew wide. She arranged a weapon and holster under her light sleeping robe and then took out a large canister, bear spray. She knew that it would work on any hostile mammal, including the one down the hallway. Then she locked her boudoir door and tucked herself back into bed. She left on the light in the bathroom and cracked the door so that she could see if any intruders encroached on her makeshift fort. Well, it was a long night for her, without much rest at all. She awakened to a litter of thunderous boom the next morning. The earlier, more distant rumbles of the storm had not awakened her from her exhausted slumber. Lightning flashed around the interior of her room, followed almost immediately by another roar that rattled the panes in her windows and vibrated the fluids throughout her body. Rain padded at her windows, and then a downpour began in earnest. The tempest roared in a different manner, like a waterfall had been set to fall from her roof and past her bedroom. She rose and nervously performed her morning routine. The storm precluded her detecting any sound inside the house, either sinister or mundane. She showered and then dressed. She hesitated for a moment and then donned the shoulder rig with a too small pistol. She didn't know what to do with a large canister of bear spray, and so she tucked it under her pillow to keep it handy, just in case. Her tracks had taught her the value of preparations for the contingencies of tomorrow. Something like what Otto used to say, stay ready so we don't have to get ready. She smiled in fond remembrance of happier times. Now the worst part of the storm had passed while she'd been under the deluge of the shower. The booming of thunder was now out a little way from the immediate area. Though the forks of lightning were gone, the atmosphere still strove with the general charge of such calls. The rain had settled into a steadily drumming rhythm, and the wind occasionally whipped against the panes with a serrating whisper, fully girded for dragon, bear or strange, and menacing, not sun, she left the room. As she turned down the handle, she realized that the door was unlocked. She was sure she had locked it in the night. It had stayed that way for the brief hours she had slept. Doubt in yourself, Mom. The too deep voice of her boy sounded from the doorway of his own room. He stretched himself like a predator, all the while spotting that leer that devolved from his wonderful grin. I told you, I'll take care of your safety and security. You worried over me for two decades. That's the least I can do. He padded past her and slivered down the stairway. Quiet as a serpent, Marie's thoughts jangled. Maybe some wild jungle beast. She shivered as she had at the earlier recollection of snakes and thoughts of large carnivores. He always was quiet, she reminded herself. Only I'm no longer sure. It's him, my MB. Well, there was nothing else to do upstairs, so she made her way down to the kitchen. Randy was not at the desk and the computer was dark. He'd clearly not used the kitchen for anything other than a glass of water, if that. She had to know where he was, though. She looked through the downstairs. The house wasn't large, so it didn't take long to find him. During the search, however, she tortured herself with thoughts that he would leap out of a closet or bathroom and terrorize her again. But he did not, and she found him gazing through the glass door that led to the patio and backyard. He stood, arms akimbo, eyes directed out into the curtain of water that continued to fall and pool outside. As far as she could tell, he did not note her presence. Of course, that's usually where he'd turn and speak, and so she waited in anticipation of the event. It did not immediately happen, and so she made her way to the kitchen for a breakfast she didn't really want. She decided to make a big pot of coffee in anticipation of a long day. She managed to get through her meal and was soon suddenly washing the dishes, her mind roiling in a manner that belayed her calm exterior. She dropped the plate from her hands when her voice sounded almost in her ear. Rain slacking, Marie. She didn't respond. She simply retrieved the item from the sink and resumed her task. 
The sinister chuckle sounded. <laughs> he has got even more quiet, she decided. Uncannily so. I like the rain, especially storms like this one. Nice and loud with the thunder. Disconcerting with the flashes of lightning. And of course, the rain. It's noisy and washes away all traces, even bad memories. He gazed over her shoulder and they watched their reflections in the window panes. Their illusory images overlaid the grey-green screen just beyond the thin barrier between comfort and the wild exhortations of nature. The image reminded Marie of when she loomed over her son's shoulder as he prepared to leave the home for the last time, when they both were younger and he, much less, terrible. His last comment had sounded almost wistful and so she took a chance. Son, why are you behaving so hostily towards me? I have nothing but love for you and I still can't believe you're back. The young man stepped back from her. You think I'm hostile? He looked confused for a moment. I don't know what else I can do. I keep smiling, even laughing for you. I've told you, I protect you. Oh, I can't seem to please you, Marie. And Marie wondered for a moment whether he was genuinely confused. And at times, it appeared that the world was a strange place for him. Her mother's heart insisted that she give him another chance, and she turned and put her hands up to his cheeks. My, he burns, she pondered. Maybe he has a fever, a high one by the feel. It could be the cause of his strangeness. Randy, I have to know. You have to try to remember. Where have you been? Why haven't you either stayed the same or aged to what you should be? He looked hurt for a moment, though other emotions seemed to flit across his features as though he was attempting to select an appropriate one for his response. Are you no longer content just to have me home? Is that not enough? Marie almost melted, but a fatigue of the sleepless night, coupled with a large dose of caffeine, stilled her conviction, and she shook her head. No, Randy, it is not. You are behaving oddly. I don't know whether you were serious about Count Bass, but I'm sure you did something with him, or to him. It's time you were counted for yourself. And he appeared to consider her admonition for a moment. If I ever lied to you. Marie was taken aback slightly, and again shook her head. No, my MB never lied to me. He always said I could read him like a book, so why bother? The figure before her chuckled, the real chuckle. The Randy chuckle. <laughs> I am your son, in all ways that matter. He shrugged. I've studied people for a long time, watched them, listened to their conversations, even forced those I've taken to teach me as much as they were able before they served their final purposes in this world. And he favored her with a grin that quickly morphed into a gaping maw, lying with a row of teeth and protruding fangs above and below. The image disappeared, almost as fleeting as the light had been. But then she knew for sure. This, or well, this was no son of hers. They provided me with knowledge and sustenance, and sometimes a little entertainment. Oh, and of course, they left me their skins to wear. <laughs> the sinister chuckle returned. Did, did you watch me? Did you see me searching desperately for my child? Have you no pity, no remorse? Could you not see my tremendous pain? Marie poured out her anger and disgust past her clenched jaws and peered at a monster before her through a blur of tears. I've watched, I've waited, i studied. I've never really understood anything about feelings. That's the part that makes my disguises so difficult. Leaves me wearing skin that makes no sense to me. I understand hostility, though, and felt it from both of your men. I should have come here sooner, but their skin had to have time to grow before I'd done it. The original was pretty damaged, so I had to use it as something like a seed. He stepped back to allow her some space to feel safe, if she so chose. Now that I've seen how easy it is to feed from within the herd, rather than awaiting strays out in the bush... <laughs> he cackled. I'll be full and content for as long as I like. 
He was interrupted by the ringing of Marie's phone. She felt almost tittered in frantic relief at the peculiar timing. Randy looked puzzled and listened with interest at her ringtone. She picked it up from the table and hit the speaker button. Marie, this is Claudia. Are you okay? Marie, never taking her eyes from the ghoulish face before her, answered. Yes, sweetie. I'm fine. How may I help you? Claudia's voice resumed. Well, I hate to ask, but you have so much experience with these things. Last night, one of the neighbors disappeared while out walking his dog. That nice older gentleman, the retired doctor. Marie acknowledged that she knew whom Claudia meant, and Claudia resumed her explanation for the call. When he didn't come back, his wife started calling neighbors and then the police. We still haven't found him and we're organizing a search. Would you please consider helping us? Uh, not a search. We have plenty of bodies for that. We want your expertise in setting up our plan. And Marie found herself nodding along, as though the fiend that stood before her was not in the room. She agreed to go to Claudia's house as soon as she was able, and she considered screaming for help but it was simply not in her character to burden others with her problems, even those of life and death. She ended the call and stared hard at the abomination at war, the son's visage, his skin. He raised a palm to forestall what she was about to say. It's all right, Mom. I'll be happy to join the searchers. Who knows what they may find? The wicked grin faded replaced by a bland but sincere expression of concern. Anything for the poor last doctor. Don't forget your rain hat, Marie spat. It was a silly thing to say, hardly an insult, but she relayed on her tone to convey her feelings of utter loathing. I'm going to help those people. I cannot care less what you do. You are not my son. You are an abomination. I don't know whether you came on your own or something sent you, but you will stay out of my way on this, unless you care to tell me where the poor fellow is. Randy stared. How would I know such a thing? I will be here when you get back. I know you are good at organizing. I'm sure they would appreciate both our efforts. And with that, he walked out of the patio door and into the now gently falling rain. Thank you so much, Mrs. Hall. Lieutenant Chandler from the local sheriff's office greeted Marie as she entered the county building where the search headquarters were located. She placed her umbrella with the others that lined the front wall. I know we can't get much done with this crazy storm, but at least we can make a plan and look at the roadways and open areas. Knock on doors. We're sending a group to scour the park. I'm afraid people in the homeless camps may cause us some problems. We won't like being disturbed while it's raining. I'm sending the deputies to that location first and keeping the civilian volunteers on the streets. Marie, the lieutenants and several others involved in managing the search efforts discussed the situation and the plan. It seemed that Dr. Wagoner had been out walking, the pair of Shih Tzu dogs he and his wife loved so well, before the storm had arrived that morning. He hadn't returned before the storm struck, so his wife began to make calls. And she was in the circle, a sweet, wizened little woman, with white hair like a ball of cotton. Marie thought kindly. Henry always takes short walks. The dogs are just little ones, Genghis and Bort, after the great Khan and his primary wife. Claudia found them hiding on her porch. He should be easy to spy. He's always wore that silly red traffic vest. He insisted that we deter the crazy drivers around here from running him over. She shook her head, worry written in every wrinkle on the vast road map of them that covered her face. And no one found Henry before nightfall. The efforts were called off until morning, when another round of thunderstorms loomed in the near distance. Marie made her way home, and she found the randy creature, as she dubbed him, sitting at a computer. Hey, Mom. He greeted her in the familiar once-loved tones of her son. Looking at the weather radar, I don't think much searching will get done for poor old Dr. Wagoner. My search team couldn't find much after all the drenching rain. We had muffled noises and kept everybody indoors and dry. I'd cleanse it so thoroughly. Not that it needs to. 
He chuckled in that sinister manner that made Marie's stomach flop. She didn't answer. She decided that the sandwiches and the snacks she'd eaten at the emergency management headquarters would hold her over until morning and made her way up the stairs to her room. Throughout the day, she nervously awaited news that one of the parties had found the body of the elderly man. She assumed that the randy creature would be in that party. And villains always return to the scene of the crime, she thought angrily. She'd argued with herself about whether to talk to Lieutenant Chandler about her increasingly dire situation. But what would she say? Oh, Lieutenant, my son has returned after twenty years. Only he's not really my son, but some sort of monstrous thing wearing my son's form. You can tell by his age. Instead of locking up the randy creature, they'd send her to the funny farm. And worse still, in her estimation, she'd no longer be able to help with the search for the good doctor. She was incredibly tired and moved about her room, preparing for bed in a desultory fashion. Then she noted that the door to her room was open, and the randy creature leered at her from just outside the portal. It sneaked up on her once again. Maybe why I was... Changing, she cringed. She and her son had always respected one another's privacy when it came to changing clothes. This creature had no respect for anything. Have fun running the show today, Marie. Marie decided that it was best to avoid engaging with this monster. Perhaps it would grow bored and leave her to her own devices. When it simply stood, staring, expression frozen, in a patient smirk, she walked over and slammed the door in his face. Go away! She shouted in her fiercest tone. The sinister chuckle sounded through the panels. She had no idea whether the thing would obey her command. It moved so silently that she could not have detected its footfalls in any case. It, she muttered. I'm standing here, talking to myself and calling my son It. This is right out of some campfire story. Maybe a horror novel. She shook her head and crawled into her bed. The little pistol rested, forgotten for the moment, on the dresser. She tucked it into her pillow and ignored the cool touch of the canister of bear spray against her arm as she fell almost immediately into a deep slumber. It didn't remain deep for long. Marie found herself awake but frozen, aware but unable to react or to move at all. The room was dark except for the occasional flashes of distant lightning and silent but for low rumbles from the tormented sky. She could not even turn her head, only roll her eyes in a vain search of her surroundings. She would have fussed and maybe even cursed, but her mouth was also frozen as everything else. She listened carefully, and rolled her eyes as far as she could towards her door. She knew she had locked it. Were those the light tread of stealthy feet? Was the door open a crack? She could not be quite sure. The shadow flitted across her vision, swift and silent as the grave. She shuddered at the unwanted imagery, or would have if her body had been capable of movement. She wished to moan in terror with the dread of the helpless when in close proximity to peril. Instead, she could only lay and flick her eyes. Her vision was occluded by an inky darkness that rose like a cobra and hovered above her face, close but not touching her. A low snarl emanated from the gloom, and she found that her olfactory senses were still in working order, along with her visual and auditory receptors. A wave of nauseating vapour wafted from the blackness. The stench of recently made corpses, mixed with older ones grown with mould and the rotting of soft tissues. The snarl faded into the sinister chuckle that informed her that her tactile senses were also receiving, as the hairs all over her body stood on end. The shadow grew silent once more and then receded. Marie lost consciousness to sleep and then startled awake, shut up in her bed as best as her aging back would allow. She looked around desperately, shaking an overwhelming sense of psychic horror that had been visited upon her. And the room was still cloaked in darkness. The storm eased into a simple rain, pattering away at the house as though intent on wearing through the windows and walls. Her door was closed. Something was off, though. She rose and made her way to the bathroom. The light was off. A little security system had apparently failed. She flipped the switch several times and then removed and checked the bulb. It was burned out. 
strange. It's one of those long life ones. She pondered through the vestiges of a much needed sleep. She checked to ensure that the door to the room was locked, and then she turned on her lamp and glanced around the room. All seemed in order, except that the pistol was missing from the top of the dresser. The handle to the bedroom door began to slowly descend towards the open position. Marie glanced around frantically. She knew that a firearm had been present before she crawled into bed. Now it was not in sight. She recalled the bear spray and quickly fished it out from under her pillow and cradled it under her arm as the door separated from the frame and displayed the stygian gloom beyond. Hard fingers with long, dirty nails crept onto the door frame and a face loomed just beyond. The eyes fairly glowed with menace. Now, Marie, I'm just checking on you. Why have you armed yourself? I am no threat to you. The tone sounded like the old sincere Randy, the boy who had loved his mother and would have done anything he could to help her. Marie nearly vomited. Get out! Get out of my room and get out of my house! You are not welcome, not wanted! The rasping, unpleasant chuckle that greeted her in response grated on her senses and recalled to her the helpless feeling from her earlier dream. She wasn't sure of anything except that the randy creature we had to go. She could no longer face the torments he imposed on her. Oh, Marie, I thought we had an understanding. The doorway opened further. Marie searched frantically for her little pistol. It had to be there, where she had left it, too close to the door. Then she noticed a lump in the shadowy space near the back of the dresser as though the weapon had fallen or been pushed onto the floor. She'd been looking for the pistol, but it was still in a soft holster and presented a different outline than her mind required. She gazed with hard intent at the figure now slithering into her room on her son's feet. The gaping maw had returned. No more verbal threats or innuendos were required. It was clearly there to feed. Marie whipped out her bear spray and pressed the lever. An orange fog enveloped the hateful features. He did not cough or flinch away from her, yet seemed confused and blinded by the mist rather than with the agony that should have ensued. Marie, coughing, her eyes instantly on fire, scrambled to the dresser and fished for her handgun. She managed to draw it from the holster before her eyes slammed shut. She didn't need to aim. The randy creature gripped her arms in his claws, and she knew where to shoot. The crack of the pistol sounded as she emptied a full magazine into the form she knew was before her. She was positive that her rounds must have penetrated the inside of the horrific gaping orifice. In a perverse reversal of her earlier paralysis, she could move as she wailed. But her senses were close to her. She could not see. Her skin burned with the fire of the pepper and the chemical element. Her ears were full and ringing from the rapport of the pistol. She was momentarily grateful for the mucus that clogged her sinuses and blocked out the stench of the terrible vapour that reeked of the corpses and the grave. She tasted the oily burn of the spray and wished to shout through it to order this foul demon back to whatever hell it had belched forth. Sound suddenly escaped her lips, but she was confounded in hearing her own words. The thick and horny nails that gouged the flesh on her arms released, and while she could not detect details of what had happened, she knew that she could not have missed at such close range, and that at last she was free from the randy creature. Mrs. Hall, thank you again for your services to the community. Lieutenant Chandler greeted her. He sounded sincere but fatigued. I'm afraid we have some terrible news. Our search teams found Dr. Wagoner's remains in the creek that runs behind the park. I was swollen with the rain. He must have fallen into it somehow. We don't know for sure until the coroner has a chance to conduct the autopsy. Marie nodded and asked, So, how is his widow? The lieutenant shook his head in a dejected manner. Not so good, I'm afraid. He rubbed the back of his neck and raised his eyes to hers. I'm afraid there's more bad news. Marie gave a brief nod of encouragement. Tell me. I can take it. 
After losing a son and a husband, what could be worse news? Chandler nodded. We found the remains of your dog. At least we think we did. Something or some kind of predator had eaten most of the carcass. I'm sorry to tell you all that, but your neighbor said that you've been looking for him. Miss Constance, Claudia, arranged to have him carried to the animal mortuary at the public shelter. I really am sorry, ma'am. You've been through so much. Marie chuckled in a manner that seemed odd to the lieutenant. A bit sinister, he decided. She grinned up at him, displaying an alarming number of teeth for such an aged person. Oh, lieutenant, I've seen my share of tribulations, but I will persevere. I have plenty to eat, adequate shelter, and lives to observe and keep me entertained and informed. She turned away and walked briskly towards the exit of the county Bilton. Note from the author. The profile points from the missing 411, researched and published by David Polodis, served as a framework for the events of this story. Regardless of our varying opinions, it is a service to highlight that tragedies do occur, many of which will be preventable with little preparation, today for the events of tomorrow. Ah, stay ready so we don't have to get ready, as my wise brother from another chat says. I think that many of the missing 411 cases with just a few more details would indicate mundane or merely rare circumstances. However, some are baffling. In the end, the truth is the perception of the beholder. There are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt in your philosophies, Horatio. William Shakespeare, Hamlet. No relation to the porcine horror. That was bigger ham. By the way, Count Bass was based on a real dog slash breed, named simply Bass. He was in our army kennel in Massu, Germany, in the mid-1980s. Uh, he was big, bushy, and frightening, yet he had a good disposition until the handler tried to put him back into the kennel. That was when he liked to climb the leash. Uh, he managed to bite a few troops, all in fun, of course, no permanent harm, uh, except for Scotty, whom he chomped on the hindquarters. Uh, he never did recover. His pride. Regards, Michael. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. Certainly another one. Wow. Michael, my oh my, that has to be top three, I think, from yourself there. And I'm sure the listeners will all agree with that sentiment. Absolutely thrilling, enthralling, mind-bending, and heartbreaking story there. Executed in only the way that you can manage. Thank you so, so much, Michael, for your constant support, your dedication, and your patience. As you know, we really do appreciate it, each and every time. I hope you are well, and those pesky hugs aren't tearing up your land. Well, guys and girls as ever, you know the drill. Please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. Now, if you think you got the minerals and could pen the next big hit, whether it's fiction or possibly a true experience or an encounter, then please do get in touch with me at the contact email, which is as on screen. Contact the dead one at gmail.com I really, really look forward to hearing from you. I hope you all had a fantastic week at work or school or perhaps you're a long distance driver. Whatever it is that you do, I hope you're enjoying it and are giving it your all. But above all guys, remember be safe not sorry. I hope you all had a superb week of school. I hope you all had a superb. I hope you all had. King King. Marie's heart filled with its. Marie's heart filled with its. Marie thanked it. Fucking hell. What's going on?